together. But Hamidi Diop has got to lead this line. This is a guy who struggled with injury all season long. But all freshman team, second team, all ACC, now to take that step in tournament play. Jonathan Polinski is our center official. We are underway. Last year, again, these two teams met in the College Cup semifinal. A game that ended 1-1, and then Clemson moved on in penalties and route to a national championship. They met in the regular season here at Riggs Field, where Notre Dame won 2-0. And again, there were nine players that played in that game that are still on the roster that won here at Clemson. KK Baffour was not one of them. A freshman plays up to Patty Burns. The junior left back puts the ball in early, headed. And Endema, the freshman keeper, makes his first save just seconds into the match. And Devin Endema, the freshman from Ghana, Standing tall early on. I love him, and this is an area that earlier this season, Mike Noonan, they didn't struggle with. They had a problem in trying to figure out who was the best player for that position. You know, with the departure of George Marks, you had a lot of talent back there. Trevor Mannion, for sure. So Mannion and Dama go back and forth until the North Carolina pit game. They hadn't had a sequential game where either one of them had started until you hit that stretch. Since then, and Dama, eight in a row. He's got a lot of talent, does have a tendency to overstep at times, but extremely athletic in goal. Derek Wallace, the transfer from Brown, plays it back and over to Enrique Montana. Montana starting at left back here. Usman Silla, we mentioned him either earlier on the ball, one of the most electric players in the country, 10 and orange. Alvaro Gomez, one of the captains, over to Montana. To Wallace. Out to the feet of Russo. We featured in the open, four goals the last two games. He had a hat trick in their come from behind win against Michigan. And a slip from Adam Lundergaard may lead to an opportunity. Baffour onto it. Cut out by Hamidi Diop. Mohamed Say on the ball, the senior from Spain, the only guy on this Clemson team that has been bruised and battered and had COVID. Number nine in the middle to start all 16 matches. Ironic given the injury issues he had throughout his sophomore and junior year missing Huge chunks of time. So, Deb, if you're Notre Dame right now, as you mentioned, they have to win this game given their RPI situation, given their their resume. What do you do if you're Chad Riley in terms of settling some nerves and kind of a must-win situation on the road? Is it wrong for me to say go score first? Is that the easy answer? <laughs> That's pretty simple. I'm, okay, go do that. It's simple enough in theory, right? But it is something to talk about because, look, they're 7-0 and when they go out and get the opening goal. And, okay, you lean into that stat a little bit. It is the fact that they've had to fight behind so often. So you don't necessarily need a goal, but I do like this. I like possession because it creates confidence within the group, a group that has really lacked consistency in that area all season long. We've seen good stuff from Patty Burns. I've seen great play out of Mayer out of the midfield. We just talked about Daniel Russo in the open, but Chad Riley is looking for an entirety of the group effort. Staying on the ball early helps give you that push and they're the fifth year helming the sidelines there and they won this tournament last year the ACC tournament first time they got there this is a very different situation for Chad Riley's crew though this year they won it as the fifth seed they had to win four games they did it they are the nine seed now and you look at that resume one four and one against the top 25 that UVA win does carry quite a bit of weight right now UVA seven in the RPI Dev let me ask you this how far do they have to go because if they win Clem beat Clemson tonight it doesn't seem like it's enough to get them in. How far do they need to go into this tournament to feel like they're going to be in the big dance again? This is where Chad Riley and I differ in opinion a little bit. You know, talking with him, he feels like a win, they're going to feel a lot better. Of course, you go win it. He said, yeah, of course, we'll feel really good about that. But I'm looking at at least two. If I see two wins out of them in terms of RPI, you're taking down a Clemson team. Then you're going to play on the weekend. You're going to get an opportunity against Duke, who's sitting at four. Those two wins right there are going to give you a boost. And it's not just against the numbers. It's the quality of play as well. That Duke team, by the way, you go on the road after beating Clemson and beat Duke, that team hasn't lost all season long. You're putting the only blemish on an unbeaten run. The committee's going to tweak their head a little bit of that. Of course, you give yourself another win. It goes further. But two for sure are good enough for me. Three, of course, is just gravy. And a foul left in there late. Wyatt Borso, the freshman, just cleaned out Silla. And Usman Silla, second team all ACC player. And again, one of the most electric, if not the most electric player in the country. And I don't think that's hyperbole, Devin. 
No, anybody will tell you in the scouting report that this is the guy that you want to keep an eye on, Ooh. no ifs, ands, or buts. It's an interesting matchup on that side, too, for Wyatt Borso, because the one thing we haven't addressed yet is with all that movement that we mentioned, 17 of 17 for this Clemson Tigers team. Different lineups throughout the season. Mike Newton hasn't had the ability to go 11. Same thing tonight. Enrique Montana going that left back spot. It's not that he's incapable, he's just a right-sided player, and that's where we've seen him all season long. So when you have a player like Silla, talented, wanders a lot more than others, you've got a lot of ground to cover. He's got speed to do it, but on the unfamiliar left-hand side, can you be as consistent when you don't have someone like an Isaiah Reed or an Alvaro Gomez shielding in front of you defensively? And to add to that, Titus Sandy Jr. will play, play the right back spot. He's traditionally a center back, so everything's kind of thrown off. Joey Skinner's the man missing the UNC uh, G transfer, a guy that's had a couple goals on the year and been a dynamic player going forward for them in the left back spot. But explain to the, uh, to the audience, why is it so different switching sides, or as we've talked before, just going from right center back to left center back? Well, number one, it, it's a tendency. Your body, just like anything else in life, you're trained. You have movements that it, it becomes a frequency within your routine. That's a simple down as open in the front door with your right hand. You go out every single day, all of a sudden it's on the other side. You, you kind of question yourself. Now imagine doing something that's moving 100 miles an hour with everybody else doing the exact same thing. Could be an opportunity for Borso, the freshman, and Dama gets a piece of it. Oh, two rookies faced up, and Dama wins that battle, yells at his back line, can't have those mistakes. Borso can't believe it. Titus Sandy Jr. pointing in the middle about communication as well. He doesn't like the fact that the pinch over doesn't happen. Watch as the ball comes back across. He gets frustrated. There's miscommunication right there between Alvaro Gomez and Chifamba. Both have an opportunity to step in, neither one. So that's some of the communication that I talk about, though. Even though Lundegaard's just underneath him, they feel like maybe he's coming for the ball. Both midfielders that drop in, they could be checking to it, and yet no one shows up. Out swinging ball, headed out by Diop. We'll go to corner number two. Devin, what's that do for Andema? You mentioned him, the freshman getting the gloves in the last eight straight games, now nine straight games. But to get two stops like that in the first couple minutes. Well, the good news is, is you step right up into the game. The bad news is, is you know that it's coming and it's going to be continuous unless the back four can really get it together here. No ball played in. Sandy Jr. gets his feet to it, but not a great clearance. Back four and Gomez battling. Burns finds the feet of Russo, boxed out, and then chance to put a ball in from a dangerous spot here. Bring it all together, Dallin. Titus Sandy on this right side. You know, confidence for the goalkeeper, Lundegaard out a little bit. We just saw the midfielders, but that little 2v1, as Sandy comes a little bit higher, he's got the speed and he's got the height. My question for him is moving out of the center back spot are his hips. How quickly can he make those turns when he pinches? Can he come back and help out in those situations? When Lundegaard's 1v1, can you come back over and give him that weak side support? Because the biggest thing you'll see out of this Notre Dame team is their ability to transition and do it quickly. They are excellent about absorbing pressure and then springing the other way, going the direction, regardless of where the starting point is on the field. Russo, dangerous ball played in, read by Wallaf. And he'll go off for the third corner of the match already as Patty Burns picks himself up off the deck, the junior from Northern Ireland. And the testing continues. How interesting the different routes that we've seen so far. Right down the middle, set piece from the corner. In swinging ball, not headed clear, headed down. Russo in a foot race with Gomez. And the Spaniard wins. 2v2 in the long ball. Josh Ramsey, the sophomore, pressured, turns it over. Silla! And Ben Giacobello gets back to bail out Ramsey. Very good, talented center back, but the first time he was tested, a little uneasy. Number 18 in white. You want to know why he's the best attacking player in the country? This is why. Look at the timing for him. And he knows exactly where the move's coming from, from Josh Ramsey. Left-sided center back. He's trying to peel it back across. And Silla... It doesn't matter on the height, only five foot seven. Great job just judging the bounce of the ball, the movement of the player, gets in behind, then uses his body to his advantage. First corner of the match for Clemson. I floated ball toward the spot, headed down by Chifumba, or the Diop, excuse me. 
just wide of the frame and Brian Dowd is happy to go pick it up off the fence not the back of the net. Almost wondered if he caught a little bit of this off his shoulder as he checks back it's hard to gain momentum and he does get his whole head. It's hard to gain momentum coming it back across his body in that fashion. Mike Noonan will be happy with the movement though. 13th season at the helm here at Clemson fifth in the country in terms of active head coaching wins at 374 now Spot stops at Brown New Hampshire and Wheaton prior to that but obviously reigning national champs won this ACC tournament back in 2020 and a number of those players these players were on that team Matthew Rue gets the turnover still Rue dances past and Damon gets a hand on it A lot of goal mouth action here early on. And pretty narrow in the attack so far for Notre Dame. There's a real good look at it, by the way, with Wyatt Borso on the backside of it, but he does start the run. Oh, no! Could be an own goal, and it is! Burns and Dow got crossed up! And Patty has just gifted the Tigers the lead! When the Irish started on the front foot. Given the start that we've seen, you would expect something like this out of the Tigers, but for the same back four and the goalkeeper that have such a chemistry within them, how can this happen? It's just a miscommunication factor. Patty Burns feels like he can get it to the goalkeeper, but Brian Dowd comes well off his line. He doesn't read it right. He feels like he's going to have to come and get this ball. Patty Burns feels like he's got an opportunity to be cute and head it back to the goalkeeper. Neither are wrong, but two wrongs here certainly don't make a right. Massive mistake here for the Irish. Burns cannot believe it. Guy that's logged a lot of minutes in a Notre Dame jersey. His 58th game, 54th start. Captains of Northern Ireland youth national team under 19 played in big games there but and big games in Notre Dame started all last two years and is that more on is that a communication issue things are happening fast easy for us to pick it apart here but you are a center back is that on down should he have stayed on his line or is that communication no it's 100 percent communication the reason that Patty Burns doesn't see him you can't overly blame him you want to have your head up and see exactly where the goalkeeper is no matter what especially if you're going to try and play back to him but what happens in those situations, Alan, is you get one-on-one, -on -one, you hear the footsteps. You hear them over your shoulder. Your head is 100% focused after the initial look of trying to make contact with the ball and get it to the goalkeeper. And the shout just isn't loud enough. The communication lacking. Doubt could come get that ball. Burns could play it back. They're both on different pages. That's why it ends up in the back of the net. Well, they went down 1-0 last year in their College Cup game and came back to battle up. 1-1 final and lost in penalties as Daniel Russo is on it. He goes down to deck and not really much appeals for a penalty there. Diop finds Silla. He's got Reed ahead of him. He doesn't play him. Silla's still running. Plays it wide. Save with the pullback. Wallaf in space. Wallaf shot. Wide. Maybe communication on one end, but it's decision making on the other. Could have played it over the right shoulder to read difficult ball. But as you spray it out here, you got to find a way to rejoin the attack with either Silla or Isaiah Reed. The reason I say that is you got 11 goals between three guys on that front line. And all due respect to Derek Walloff, he has none to his name. Now, he is an all Ivy League player who's transferred over two time honorable mention. But that's more of a missionary within the middle. He controls the tempo of the game. He gets stuck in. He leads by example. He's not exactly the guy. If I'm pulling out an attacking option out of that front three, the, the next man up is going to be Wallaf. Wallaf on it now, battling with Reese Mayer. Finds Elton Chifamba, Crew Academy product from Ohio. Out to Sandy. Gomez. Good crowd on hand here at Historic Greeks Field, as always. Tough place to play. But Notre Dame did start well, but down because of the own goal in the 11th minute. Say. 
Chifamba. Pained out to Montana. Silla, he'll pop up wherever he wants on the field. Threaded it to Montana, but read well by Ramsey. A scoop pass may start a break here. Rue on it. Baffler. Little slide rolled ball to Russo. Controls it well. Deflected by Lundergaard into the feet of Gomez. Sandy Jr. getting his 10th start of the season, the red shirt. Jr. Excuse me, his seventh start of the season. Wallaf. Lundegaard. Isaiah Reed on the ball, last year's most outstanding player in the College Cup had the two goals that gave them the national championship over Washington, 27 in orange. He, like everybody else on the team, dealt with some injury issues. It's that championship time of year, folks. Tomorrow, women's soccer semis start at 5.30 Eastern here on ACC Network. Number one, North Carolina taking on Duke. Then at 8 Eastern, the defending national champs, FSU, taking on the number three seed, Notre Dame. Friday, you got field hockey championships, UVA against UNC. UNC looking to win their sixth straight ACC field hockey title and then of course the men's soccer quarterfinal start at 2 Eastern on Sunday will be on the first of four matchups which is going to be Virginia Tech against Wake Forest shockingly in the now 12-4 matchup to start the day at 2 o'clock first game of a quadruple header on ACC Network Sunday Devin can you believe Virginia Tech was 0-8 no. in ACC <laughs> play this year and uh, they go and just... beat a Louisville team ranked 11th in the nation that is uh, that, that is next level from Mike Brizendine and the Hokies. It's something that I'm sure in terms of an upset, quote unquote, numbers wise, Chad Riley would like, although the 8-9 a little bit closer. Three wins. That was their third win of the season and their first against an ACC opponent. How to do it against a team that just got named into the top five for the committee rankings. That's beyond impressive. Trying to do what Mike Young and the Virginia Tech Hokies did on the basketball court this fall, this spring. They had to win the ACC tournament to get to the big dance. They did that in pretty impressive fashion. Mike Brizendine's crew does it, though. It'll be quite more shocking, though, from the 12 spot in the ACC men's soccer tournament. It's the best soccer conference in the country, and I guess another proof point, you see a number of the 12 seed upsets Louisville. You see the committee rankings last Friday. These were unveiled as the top 16. So if the, if the tournament started that day, the NCAA tournament, here would be your top 16. These are the four from the ACC, and Louisville, there you see, is number five. Reese Mayer getting a talking to by Jonathan Belinsky. Our friendly reminder within those, though, is Louisville already had one loss on their resume to Wake Forest last Friday night in primetime. They had a second one in tournament play and then a couple of draws. Duke going unbeaten in both the regular season and conference play. How does it even happen <laughs> in the quality we have in this conference? It's wild, man. Diop on it, junior from Senegal via Montverde Academy. Good distribution out of the back, as always. Finds the feet to say. Hopped off of his feet to Chifamba. Big switch. Say on it. Chifamba pings it out. Priscilla. Tana head up. Cross is wayward though. Might
Chifamba finds Silla in a little pocket of space. He's always deadly there. Sprays it out to Sandy on the overlap. He's going to get there. He's got orange shirts in the box. Tries to cut it back, but for a good read. Finds the feet to say, lays it off to Silla. After a pretty wild start, the game has settled down a little bit here, Devin. I would say I really like what Notre Dame's doing in terms of trying to hold off on some of the possession. This is a mistake right here on both sides of the ball. He gets a little bit lucky here. Reese Mayer being bailed out. But what they've done is they've pinched KK before and White Borso a little bit more narrow than we've seen. One of them coming in and even two at times, but they are really holding that in centrally. And as Daniel Russo comes underneath, it's a five-man front. And so on the attacking side, it's harder to get any one of your midfielders on it. So they're trying to stretch him to the outside, win a little 1v1 battle, and then quickly cut in. You're seeing a lot of balls into Reed, into Say's feet to try and narrow the gap at the top of the 18, then drop back off and go the other direction. Out to Borso, had a golden opportunity early on. Borso did the freshman 1v1 with Endema, but shot it low to the keeper's right. He made the save. Say he's got his head up, he's got some options. Wallace making the run in front, plays him, but well read by Ramsey. Ramsey put it out for a throw. The orange wall, as they're known here at Historic Riggs Field, in full effect. They got the band out there. Always a tough place to play. Had about 6,300 people for the season opener against Indiana. A top 15 clash that was, it delivered, Devin. We were there for it. Live and in color, 3-2 was the win for the Tigers. Montana, back to Silla. Can't give him a lot of space. He'll move fire. Reed over to Sandy. Baffle makes it look easy. And Sandy pulled him down. Seems like an eternity ago, a game against the Indiana Hoosiers. Clemson Tigers almost at full strength at that point in time. Indiana would go on to lose a couple, drop out of the top 25 since regained that composure. All done by before to drop down in. Some of that composure that Chad Riley saw earlier on this game, the aggression, weren't able to get it. A little bit aggressive in that game, though. In the NC State and Pitt Panthers, 1-1. And the overtime rules are now different this year. There was no overtime in regular season in college soccer. It is present now in the tournament, both conference and the NCAA tournament. You will play the full 10 minutes of two halves of extra time. No matter what, if anybody scores, there is no more sudden victory or golden goal, if you will. So we'll keep you up to date on what's going on in Pitt. Back to here, an opportunity maybe for the Irish. Baffour catches it, I mean, receives it, I should say, but not the softest of feet there. Reese Mayer lining up a long throw. Padded move for the Irish over the years. They're going to get that ball in a box. Come hook or crook, and here it comes. Headed out by Wallace. Giacobello back into the mixer. Mike Noonan told us how important the transitional moments will be. Let's see if the Tigers try to break out here. Borzo cleaned out by Diop. Diop's known to take a card unnecessarily, and he may have just done that. Yes, he did. All ACC second team junior, one of the best center backs in the country, just laid out Matt Rue there. And that's been a rough year for him. Finding a way to maintain his health and fitness and all of that, you start to question your body at times. And even when you think you can do something down, sometimes it's that slight hesitation a little bit late to the parade. He's still massive talent. Six foot junior. Great possessional skills. His distribution coming off the back line can hit a set piece from 
otherworldly range. Baffour to take it. A freshman from Ghana via Southport, Connecticut, the Taft School. Mayer got his head to it just over the net, though. Taking a look at that. This was an area last season they were incredible at. It was set piece opportunities one point time in the year, right around 49% of their goals were coming from dead ball situations. It's not the same this year. Joey Skinner checks in the match, battling a little bit of an illness right now. Normally a starter does not start in this match. We'll come back to him in a second. Do want to tell you about the ACC Network huddle coming your way Saturday morning, 11 a.m. Eastern. The cuddle crew, Jordan Cornell, the guys from Raleigh, North Carolina, to get you set for full day of football. Also have halftime shows, pre- and post-game shows throughout the day. The 6.30 show gets you a complete wrap-up of the afternoon's games and get you set for the primetime matchup. Why they're in Raleigh? Yes, the number 22 named ranked team in the country, NC State, hosting the number 21 ranked team in the country, Wake Forest, 8 o'clock Eastern ACC Network or the ESPN app. A couple of big games in ACC football. Isaiah Reed might get to this one. Dowd is off there. Reed complaining for something. He's complaining. Not sure if he's saying there was a hand on the ball or what there, but uh, last year's most outstanding player in the College Cup couldn't win the foot race there. So now Joey Skinner, as you mentioned, the UNCG transfer, First team all Southern Conference last year has popped up and had big goals at big times this year. Game winning goal at UMass where they went on to win in a couple goals. But the game winner at UNC late in the game in Chapel Hill we did his 17th appearance. He started 14 games on the year. So this kind of reshuffles their lineup. Enrique Montana now throwing the ball yep. in is the normal right back. Lundergaard a normal right center back. Diop left center back and Skinner left back. What does that do for him to get him back in their normal positions? Albeit, do you have to pay attention? Skinner's bad a little illness. Do you, do you do anything different on that back line knowing that he may not be 100% depth? No, you're not going to change anything because of the depth that you have there. Obviously, Mike Noonan just trying to handle some of the, the loadage that he's able to carry throughout the game. 20 minutes to go. You would think that a player is going to be able to get a 20-minute run out of him. If he wasn't, he's not going to put him in there and say, oh, you know, give me 20 minutes at 70%. Attacking options, maybe you could have a shout there, but not for someone like Joey Skinner. What you want to make sure is that you're getting high enough in the attack. We hadn't seen enough of that, but also it's just the consistency within the back line. They've been shook here early on, even though they've stepped on the ball a lot more recently. You've got to start to flatten it out and converse a little bit more. Chifamba can't connect with Silla. Reed. Ball will find its way to say, though. And Skinner's first foray forward. To Wallach. Trying to play say in the channel. And Mitch Ferguson, freshman from Illinois, plays it out to touch. Hangs a ball on a rope, looking for Montana, just a little too much on it. All right, here's earlier what Isaiah Reed was upset about. And Devin, you said this to me through our, our great talkback systems. Nobody else could hear it. It was a pass back, you believe. That's what he's looking for here. And here's the thing is, what's the argument coming from Notre Dame that he's not trying to get a touch on the ball, that he's not trying to play to the goalkeeper? Well, that's all well and good. But in that touch right there, you're extending away. The ball's moving away from you. It towards the goalkeeper creates an advantage. It's subjective from the referee. Was he actually trying to play it back to the goalkeeper? For me, you reach a 50-50 area where sometimes you just got to lean into it. That's one where I look at it as the defender and Notre Dame are getting the benefit of the doubt when I wouldn't have given it there. To me, that's a pass back. 
To me, he's looking at the goalkeeper with an opportunity, pulls out of it just to touch it. As he touches it, he knows that he's going to get bailed out. And again, you can only play it back to the keeper off your head or chest where he can then handle it with his hands. A back pass with your feet to his hands is not allowed. It should have been, in your vision, an indirect free kick there from the spot that Dowd touched the ball. But Jonathan Belinsky, the middle official, did not believe that's the case as Isaiah Reed runs down back for him. Don't forget the widely recognized use of the shoulder, which is uh, oh so popular playing it back to the goalkeeper. Seems a little risky, but I, yes, the shoulder works. <laughs> It's amazing what you, you, you take advantage of a Sunday league these days. Whoa, Diop made a play on that one, <laughs> and Damo's out to claim it. Here we are from historic Riggs Field alongside Devin Kerr. I'm Dallin Cuff. Clemson, the defending national champs, but yes, playing in the 8-9 first round game of the ACC tournament, taking on Notre Dame, who these two teams met in the College Cup semifinals last year. Clemson advancing on penalties en route to that title. They're up 1-0 through a own goal as a player is down writhing in pain, Reese Mayer. Play on, though. An own goal through Patty Burns in the 12th minute is the difference right now. Matt Rue trying to equalize, going one on four. Still Rue. Wyatt Borso on it. Finds Baffour. And Mayer's still down. And finally, Belinsky brings the ball back. And you, you hear the, uh, the frustration from the Notre Dame bench. Whenever the player grabs their head, it's usually an immediate stoppage of play. And he's been down on the deck for about 30 seconds now. What's interesting is he's actually, there he goes, now he grabs the right side. And there's no argument against Mohamed Say, both of them just competing. When you look at the, the negative side of who's actually at fault here, right, who takes the blame, you can't argue for one or the other because they both go vertical, they both go straight up, no one's momentum is protruding into the other's run. He's just coming back across his body, Reese Mayer, and unfortunately collides with really probably the only other player outside of Hamidi Diop that he wouldn't win that argument against. Well, Brandon Parrish now checks in the game for Derek Walloff, and you saw Kyle Genenbacher coming on for the injured Mayer. Genenbacher, the sophomore from Missouri, part of the STLFC Academy, St. Louis FC Academy. Used to be starting this lineup. It's not started the last four games since they've kind of we adjusted things with Mitch Ferguson and moved some things around. And Parrish coming in, the junior, number 11 in orange from Nashville, two-time Gatorade Player of the Year in Tennessee, closing down the ball there. Brought down well by Rue, all ACC freshman team last year. Dispossessed there, nicely by Parrish. Welcome to the match. Gennenbacher dispossessed. Gomez hooks his pass over to Montana. He's got a lot of green in front of him. Ramsey stepping through the defense, then clipped. Isaiah Reed, I don't know if he's getting the, the yellow for consistent infringement or for a little bit of dissent and talking back, but he's going into John Hablinski's book either way. Deb, you agree? I'm going to take the former. It's a couple of arguments here because it's just over and over and over again. One no, twice no, three times maybe. Okay, now you get it. A little tug, plenty of players around him. It's just one where you've been on the forefront of the referee's mind for too long of a period of time. Easy enough for him to step in. To read the senior from Charlotte carrying a yellow, as is Hamidi Diab, center back. Two yellows issued in the match, both to the home team, Tigers. Ramsey, the sophomore from San Antonio. All ACC freshman team member plays it long. Gennenbacher, tough start to this game, dispossessed again. And say, when he gets on the run, he's 6'3", but he got good feet. And 
All evidence to the contrary. <laughs> I mean, that goal he scored at Indiana, first game of the season, is oh. highlight reel forever and ever. It was impressive. Dancing, cutting back on guys outside of the boot finish. Well, that's kind of what Chad Riley's looking for right now, and it may be part of the change of what you're seeing. They're trying to find a way to play. I mentioned how they had restricted the middle of the field. They, they've moved away from that a little bit because they haven't been able to play through either two of the strikers up top, and Daniel Russo and Matt Rue. A lot of it is just balls coming back through and having them run, and as they go, they separate themselves from the rest of the pack. You bring in someone like Enuenta, whether on the right or you drop him up onto that front line, he'll come down and he'll slow the game down a little bit for you, but in a good way. He'll allow you to have support all the way around, and that'll earn you a card. Bryce Bonneau getting in start ahead of a restart, getting in front of it, and unnecessarily the sophomore from Texas, former national Gatorade Player of the Year. He'll go in the book. There's just no reason for it, though. I mean, yeah. this is something that at the end of a game, Dallin, this comes back to haunt you. And you can look at the fact that, yeah, they lost some influential players, but they gained a ton. This is the number three freshman class in the nation, but 16 separate players for this team have had the opportunity to wear the shirt in the starting lineup, nine of which are either freshman or sophomore. That gives you an idea of how young this team is. Really talented, but that's a young mistake right there for Chad Riley's guys. Yeah, again, a lot of guys that did feature in the AC NCAA final last year, it's College Cup, excuse me, on this Notre Dame roster, nine guys. But to your point, a lot of those guys were young players. And some of them, like Patty Burns, 15 and white, is now just becoming a junior. Ramsey was a freshman. Mayer played in that game. Rue, Russo, you can go through them. But it's still a, a lot of young dudes, only two either seniors or grad students in there starting a lineup. Or so, one of those freshmen heads it off of Parrish. Mike Newton not too happy. A couple subs coming in here for both clubs right now. You mentioned Enhoento a few minutes ago. Now he's joining the fray. Number nine in white there, the sophomore from Derby County, England of Matthew Radaboisa. The Toronto, Ontario native. Played for the Canada Youth National Team, the U15 level. Also ran out some camps for the Serbian National Team. His qualifying from his family heritage there. Injured all of last year, hoping to make a difference here in this game. So Ento and Radovoisa in for Notre Dame. Long throw again. Ferguson flicks it down. Bat four shot save right into the bread basket of Endema. Now you wonder from Chad Riley's point of view, he's hoping eventually they're going to get some luck, right? This is going to fall because the way that the bounce comes in, the touch from bat four all sits up perfectly. Last year, it's probably 3 0 by now. And the way that Notre Dame had Lady Luck on her side, that just hasn't been the case for the Irish this year, ironically. So much talent and plenty of opportunities. I look at the opening 15 minutes of this game, full control. Now you're starting to see the Clemson Tigers a lot more comfortable on the ball. Still overall, though, this isn't the finished product that either one of these coaches are looking for. Some silly mistakes on either end. Got to clean up some of the finishing opportunities. That's the major difference from Really what we saw last season would make the argument for Notre Dame as well, though, that, you know, the communication on that goal, Dallin, not saying that it wouldn't have happened if it was last season, but Philip Quinton on the back line. You had Mohamed Omar in the middle. They led by example. They were extremely vocal. Moments like that just never occurred within the team because it was driven into them that you had to put one foot in front of the over, over and over again. And unfortunately, that gets them into trouble, and it's happened a bunch of times this season. Leadership, not an underrated quality, a quality lacking in our country, by and large. But wasn't on the Notre Dame team last year. This year, it's a lot of young guys. And now an opportunity for going transition. Marco Garcia's first touch of the ball, 26, who just came in the ball for Isaiah Reed, in the game for Isaiah Reed. Pass a little too much on it for Usman Silla. Okay. 
Vento and Lundergaard, a little bit of a battle. Had her flicked on, looking for Isaiah Easley, 29, who just checked in the match as well. A freshman from Hawaii. And the winner gets Duke, the number one team in the ACC, the regular season champs. Unbeaten team in the country, one of three to boast that moniker. 8 o'clock Eastern ACC Network. Foul called there on Jacobella. I don't know my favorite thing about either one of the conversations with the coaches. It was hearing Mike Noonan say, when I mean, you talk about focus and, and what they're really working on and how the season's going, he just said, guys are having fun. I mean, it's really difficult with everything that they've gone through this year. The bodies, the injuries, COVID, you know, having had fluent results to maintain a positive outlook within the group. And he said they're having fun. They're really enjoying the game. And that's obviously the most important thing. Montana finds the feed of Garcia, the Italian native. Looks like he was going for gold there. Had it on and go out harmlessly. Mention these teams have history from the College Cup last year, but also they played in the regular season too. Down here at Historic Riggs Field. And Notre Dame pulled off a shocker. This is when they started to get things right, Devin. It seemed like this Notre Dame TV special, Matt Ruse finishes there en route to a 2-0 win, but then the Tigers won the one that really mattered. Philip Quinton's penalty saved by George Marks. He goes nuts, and rightfully so. Justin Malou slots at home, 5-3 PK win. Clemson moves forward. They beat Washington 2-0 in the NCAA final for their third championship in school history. Out of voice ahead up, looking for Rue. Does last year's games, again, there were a number of players that played in these games from both teams. Does that factor at all in any one of these in this game here? Because of the, the recent nature of it, absolutely. You know, they'll, they'll call it a rivalry for a reason because you build it over a couple of years. Now, that's not necessarily the case here, but you do, you do recognize the guys that were on the other side of the pitch. You'll understand when you go and look at tape, Dallin, that, okay, you remember what the scout was like there, what's changed within it. I still look at this, though, and because of how often the teams see each other in this conference, this comes down to pride. Everybody takes so much pride within the ACC about being the best, the opportunity to be the number one, to hold the title, to go chase a star at the national level. And so that's something that, oddly enough, for both teams, you're kind of looking at the same thing, right? Even though they're off a little bit, Notre Dame takes down the entire tournament, an opportunity to chase that dream once again because they fell just short at the national level. And yet Clemson, who got bounced earlier than they would have liked, they've still got an opportunity at the ACC title as well. And guess what? The reigning national champs. That's still something that they can go after here. So, yeah, you bring it all back together, those memories are still fresh in your mind. Brian Dowd, the keeper, back to him. He played an integral role in them getting to the College Cup. In the postseason games, in their eight games, he only allowed two goals. They had three penalty shootouts. They won two of them. But he'll want to forget that own goal to start this game. That is the difference right now. Notre Dame started on the front foot, but a 12th minute own goal through Patty Burns' header past Dowd is how we ended up right here. at a 1-0 Tigers lead, six minutes to go in the first half. Chance now for Alvaro Gomez, the senior from Spain, to put it in the box. Ball driven in, headed down. We got another own goal. You got to be kidding me. And the Tigers go up 2-0, and Brian Dowd, not a night to remember. You 
How could it be? I mean, there's just traffic all in front of the goalkeeper for Notre Dame. Difficult on the first one between Patty Burns and Bryant down the 11th minute. The ball up over the top. This time, look at all the bodies. And it's coming all the way back across. Gannenbacher, Chad Riley talks about what a piece he's been to this squad since coming back in. His movement from the outside, taking his central role within the midfield. But the pressure is actually coming from Jacobello, his own teammate. Not an orange jersey in sight to get you into trouble, and yet you've padded the lead for the home squad. Wow, who would have thought this? It's Notre Dame team, two own goals in the first half to put them deep behind the eight ball. And again, what's at stake for them is they are 48th in the RPI right now. If the tournament started today, it's safe to say they would not get an at-large bid. They got a chance here on the road against a Clemson team that's number 13 in the RPI. If they win, they get Duke, the fourth team in the RPI. It's hard to win these games, but you're getting yourself an opportunity, and it's going down the drain because of things like this. Okay, communication again. Two, two guys in one situation. lindergaard has got a good back post run, and Diop's there as well, but they've pulled out of this. They are far away from the movement itself. Both guys coming back inside. It's no different than a wide receiver, two outfielders. You've got to call one guy off. That's the situation you're in right now. You're both competing. You're fighting for the ball. Someone's got to take precedent in the situation. This goes back to what I was saying. A Mo Omar, a Philip Quinton, they step right through that ball. Down, I had a kid, his name was Cleveland Brown. Got an opportunity to go play for Newcastle United coming out of high school. The kid was beyond talented. I can remember being about 18 years old playing at the club level. And I'm a center back, and this is a striker. Ball came back through, bounced. It's bouncing all over the place. He cleared the ball so hard, he cleared it right through me. Almost broke my foot. I had to hobble off of the field. And he looked at me, and he said, next time you'll do your job. That's the situation <laughs> you're in. you got to step through. Someone's got to take command of that situation. As we look at this again, you mentioned people calling each other off in terms of center back. Should Dowd come out and claim this? I mean, it kind of lands within the six-yard box. Like, if, if you want to come get it as a goalkeeper, I'm okay with it. I, I don't think you have to. Okay. Can you? Yes. Here's the thing that you, we're judging a book by its cover at this point in time. We're Monday morning quarterbacking, right? Because you can see the runs coming. At real time, he's got to be cognizant of the fact that he's got Lindegaard and Diep on the back post as well. If he's having trouble judging that ball on the lights a little bit and he hesitates, and I'll give him that, he's still got two guys on the back post. So I'd rather have one of my center backs in that given situation right there step up and clear this ball away, especially because the run, when you head this, you can head this over the line or out across the sideline. It's not like you're heading this back into a danger area. It's going to be away from everybody else. Unfortunate for Clemson, to say the least. Down 2-0 here in the first half. Enoento on the ball, Derby County product. Team of the championship over the second division in England. A good youth career, played it out wide, could not get it to Giacobello. Coming up a half, we'll look around the tournament. Again, already had a shocker, Virginia Tech knocking off Louisville. Show you highlights of that. North Carolina, late winner. And I believe Pitt and NC State are still battling right now. It is 1-1. Deep in the second half of that match, 84th minute. So we'll get you updated, everything you need to know around that. We'll also look at, talking about Notre Dame's on the bubble, North Carolina firmly planted on the bubble as well right now. And they have an opportunity as they move, head, move ahead in their tournament to pad their resume. They're 47 in the RPI. And next up, they will have Syracuse, number two seed, top five RPI opportunity on the road in central New York. Gomez plays it out wide. Strobeck, who just entered the match a few minutes ago, gets end line, puts in the side netting. Sophomore from Sweden, Hasselholm Academy, Division II in Sweden. Had a Series C offer, the third division in Italy. Chose to come play at Clemson instead of that. Smart move, young man. Go 
I'm sure Mike Newton's not going to be upset with the fact that regardless of who touched the ball into the back of that, it seems up to nothing. Absolutely. Just a reminder, folks, Michigan, Notre Dame, they were playing about 10, about a week ago now. Michigan up 2-1 in the 80, 84th minute. Daniel Russo, almost called him Lil Russo because he's going to fight. Back-to-back -back goals in a couple minutes. <laughs> to get them the 3-2 win to keep their season alive. They may need another heroic effort like that. Deb, what do you make of the first 45? It's confusing with, with the incredible start that was for Notre Dame. They were on top of this Clemson team. They had opportunities. They pushed their level high. You start to transition the other direction. You open the game up. You open your opponent up and create more space for yourself in the moving process. Jonathan Belinsky blows his whistle. The second half is underway from Clemson, South Carolina. The last game of the night in terms of kickoff time, but Pitt and NC State are still playing in their first round opening match. And we'll have an update for you on that shortly as the deadlock has been broken in overtime. And now that we are in tournament play, overtime is back on the docket. Two 10-minute halves will be played. There is no sudden victory or golden goal. And as you see, Pittsburgh's up 2-1 through a Michael Sullivan header in the 92nd minute. The young fellas got two goals in a big time. And let's take a look at the goal by Sullivan. Oh, just two minutes in. How's the run to the near post? Great run here by Michael Sullivan. And if you're just joining us, I told you at halftime, he scored the opener. Jay Vidovich is really high on that young man. And he said that the entire season, he's grown as an individual within the team, able to possess within the midfield, loves his pressing efforts defensively up next to guys like Valentin Noel and Bertin Jacasson. But as they move forward into the final third, needed to be more aggressive. I'm sure the Toru goals will help his case. No doubt about it. And Baffour taken down, and it'll be the third yellow of the match. This one, fourth yellow of the match, third to Clemson, to uh, Enrique Montana, the native of... Duval Washington, Sounders Academy product, taking down KK Baffour. I respect the comments by Mike Noonan. I want to be very clear. I get it. He said, you know, it's just the way that they, the guys trained. That's why I started that way defensively. But there is something to be said about taking a player and Enrique Montana, who's been on the right-hand flank all season long, and putting him at the left-back spot to start the game. That tells you within Noonan's decision process, that or decision-making process, excuse me, that he's thinking, okay, if I'm going to move pieces, I can move Montana to an outside back spot, just unfamiliar over there. Titus Sandy had played in the right back position before, and then you've got two able-bodied center backs that are, that are familiar in there. But then you change it 20 minutes in. Is it because of training? Is it because of injuries? It is something different, and yet they're able to come out unscathed. So regardless of if you agree with the decision or not, they kept the clean sheet in the opening 45 minutes. And they were threatened, though, early on, as we mentioned and just showed you, if you're just joining us, the Wyatt Borso, the freshman, was 1v1 against Endema, the freshman keeper, within the first minute. They had a couple other chances, but another shutout in the making for the freshman, looking for his seventh on the campaign in 12 starts. Would be a big one to get in tournament play, no doubt. But since then, about the last 15, 20 minutes, since the 15, 20 minute mark-ish, Notre Dame has not generated much, and Clemson's been much more solid on the ball, much more solid in the defense as well. Chief Fumba switch it out to Montana. Derek Wallaf, the, excuse me, it's Brandon Parrish, pardon me, on the ball. Well done by Isaiah Reed to play to the path of Silla. He's got options, plays it wide. Skinner on the overlap, floats it back post. And Patty Burns got to it just before Isaiah Reed was there to pounce. Well done by Problem. Junior from Northern Ireland. Problem you First run into. Goal you know on his is. docket. Sorry, man. 
you chase a little bit more here. You open yourself up, and, and sometimes you want to, but the pressure, notice as the high line comes, you don't have the back line come as high. Your midfield's a little bit too up, and you don't have that denseness you did about him in the start of the first half. It's a good move by Patty Burns on the backside just to clear it away, but that's where you can get into trouble if you don't all move together. Parrish was unmarked, but the pass was left short. Leading to a Notre Dame transition the other way. Russo over to Baffour. He's got options coming down the right flank. Borso to Jacobello. Excuse me, Bono to Jacobello. Mayer. Bono. Nice job by Skinner to push him off the ball. And Skinner can stride forward. He's got Reed, just couldn't get enough on it to get past Burns. <laughs> Diop's clearance in the feet of Ento. And if you're just joining us, again, why this game matters so much, not just to win the ACC championship and a chance of how good that trophy is and the chance to punch your automatic ticket. Notre Dame's a, on a bubble team right now. Chad Riley said to us before this game, we got to win. With an RPI of 48, they're not getting into the NCAA tournament. They were a College Cup semifinalist last year. They won this tournament last year, starting from the fifth seeds. So they had to go four games in four days. But you see what the RPI is. You see them one, four, and one. This is a must win, correct, Devin? 100%, and I would uh, make the argument, as I did in the first half, that you got to win at least one more as well. Now, you win this game, given the strength of schedule, RPI, and it certainly doesn't hurt to take down the reigning national champion. Progress onto the weekend against Duke, and then take down Duke. That's the number four overall in terms of RPI. When you look at the committee's ranking of them, that's also going to make them give a balk at that as well, because they're number three within the committee ranking. So it's coaches, it's committee, it's RPI. Those two should do it. Three is a 100% guarantee. Pat four on it. Clips it in. Feet a read, though. With that said, Devin, that this is a must win, at what point or at all do you start to do things differently and maybe a little bit more desperation if you're Notre Dame to generate scoring chances? Ento on the turn. Chad Riley's not really going to change for anybody, and I do respect that about him because he said it's a results-driven process, that we, we have to do the same process over and over again, and we trust that. And a lot of people questioned that at the beginning of last season, and yet, look where they ended up. Ball played in, opportunity for, but no! Big time block by Lundergaard. Still an opportunity, Ruan cuts it back, and eventually the flag does go up from the near side AR. Chris Zerner. Dallin, you move away from that process and everything that you work towards, it clouds your decision making, movements become erratic, and it's more difficult to actually find consistent sequences to build off of. This is why they get an opportunity here. Put the ball on the deck, they've got the high line, and it's cute little touches around the box. This is something that I was really impressed with last year that has funneled over into this season. If you watch, they don't necessarily take the immediate opportunity because it's not the best one. Just because you've got a glimmer of hope and a window to operate through from 25 yards out doesn't mean that you have to attack it. Usman Silla now going to be carded for kind of standing in front of the restart. I mean, Dev, he, 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 I, there are times you're doing it on purpose. I feel like the ball was just put this. down and booted off him. Yeah, I don't agree with this whatsoever. Now, referee's going to look and turn around and see Silla sitting right in front as they try and play again. But watch him as he comes back into the screen. The argument is that he's going to run in front of the path right there. But now he's got hands up. At this point in time, the normal sequence of events, the way this plays out, player comes over. Okay, should he jump in front of the ball? Not necessarily, but gentleman's contact turns to the referee, hands up, slowly starts to back away. If the referee had already approached him and said something, I could understand the card. It's a bit harsh for me, though, to give it that direct. So now we got four Clemson players sitting on yellows. Bear in mind, Notre Dame did just play a game against Pitt where Giannis Learman got his second yell in the 48th minute, and they played Panthers did down a man for nearly a half and Notre Dame couldn't capitalize on that opportunity. They scored to make it 1-1 but could not break through and get the winner. Spino tries to dance through Ento. 
Still in tow. Looks like he almost tripped on the ball, and Silla comes away with it, and here come the Tigers. Ramsey has some words for Say, standing over him as the big fellow went down easily. Rue on the ball. Brings the crowd to life a little bit here. Bat four. Low ball played in. Diop gets his foot to it. Brandon Parrish able to keep it. Nope, not in play. Take a look at what got the crowd going a little bit. And now a couple other yellows being brandished here. This one for... Trying to get confirmation is it on Ramsey or Say. Ramsey did kind of stand over Say and had some words for him. Notre Dame players talking to Jonathan Belinsky. Christmas has come early, my friends. Can we chill on the Christmas music already, people? It's it's November 2nd, all right? We oh, just finished oh. Halloween. Hallmark Channel is lighting it up with movies right now. Oh, oh my gosh. You're one of those guys? We're already we're already on a Christmas rotation. We haven't even got the Thanksgiving. We're three weeks from Thanksgiving. No, I'm not into it. Card was it's on just, Ramsey. It's it's, it's 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 on the channel at the gym. On the gym? What kind of gym yeah. are you going to? Find a new one. Working out to Thank Hallmark you. movies? I can't control the, the channel thing on my favorite treadmill. That bothers me. I'm not switching treadmills. It's right up against the window. No one blocks my path. It's perfect. Uh -oh. it, it's getting real frisky here. And the ball was thrown. And uh-oh. Bye-bye. Bryce Bonneau is getting an early shower. The sophomore from Texas. He was carrying a yellow from the 32nd minute. And now he just earned a second one. And what went like a difficult task may have just become impossible for Notre Dame. Notre Dame players appealing for no reason because it ain't going to change the call. Clemson fans like it. And Bedeau inconsolable as he will get a red card in his first ACC tournament game, missing all of last year because of an injury, former national Gatorade player of the year out of high school, and Silla will walk off with the training staff. I told you in his first yellow card in the 32nd minute, Dallin, that there was some young mistakes from this team. Nine of 16 players who have stepped into the starting 11 are either freshman or sophomore, and that is a terrible mistake by Bryce Bonneau, the young man who's got a lot of talent. But yes, it's a foul. You come from behind, you step on the player's ankle. Even if you disagree, you got to be smarter in these situations. Guys are going to bark at you. The game is going to get more heated, but you got to keep a calm head. It's a foul. There's no doubt about it. But even if you disagree, you've got to be smart sitting on a yellow. Otherwise, you put your team in a bad spot, and that's exactly what's going on here. And Chad Riley is looking for John Polinski to come. He said, I want to know what's going on. I'm no lip reader, but I'm pretty sure that was it. He just wants an explanation as to what happened there. And Reese Mayer got a yellow as well. He picked up the ball and whipped it. And you can see that catches it and throws it. This seemed like that was guaranteed to be a yellow. The bigger issue, though, and Bonneau knows it as he's walking away at 13, that he's going to get one, too. And when he gets one, that's the second one, and he gets an early shower. I will say this one thing. To kind of come around the entire situation, if I'm the referee, now I don't disagree with the first yellow that he gave him, but when you're in a situation such as this, I'm not talking about tournament play. I'm talking about a game. It's 2 nothing. The game's wide open. I'm okay with the referee verbally giving a last warning in that situation as opposed to drastically changing the entire dynamic of this game. Don't think he's wrong for sending him off, but a verbal warning saying that is your last infraction or you are out of here, that to me suits the overall game better. Yeah, it's hard to argue where you're coming from, I and mean, we've seen him given for that offense, but you also see them not given for that offense when it's a yellow, second yellow 
lot of times there is discretion in refereeing. That is not a black and white business. It is not binary. It is incredibly difficult. And you could see it from either way, in all honesty here. But the man in the middle, Jonathan Blinsky, saw it as a yellow. But no, is out. Notre Dame down to 10 men, and they need two goals at least to keep this thing alive. Keep their season alive. Rue, heavy touch, but cuts inside as Skinner misplayed it. Could be an opportunity. Rowe, Rue still on it. He goes down, no call. But he was searching for a pen versus trying to create a play. And now Reed's in a lot of space. Brandon Parrish tearing up the left flank. He's got Say in the middle. Reed on it. The senior. Gets some help. Silla tees it up. Deflected. Falls to Parrish. Deflected. Outside of the boot, pass to Skinner. Early ball played in. Reed raises for it. Saw him score from just about that range in the national championship game last year in a beautiful looping header. It gave him a 2-0 victory for the national title. They're having a little fun moving it side to side now. Ten men or not, this is still very pretty. And I would like to say some of the decision making from Isaiah Reed just escaping him over the course of this season. Certainly tonight, a lot of really threatening options here for him the Clemson Tigers and yet the movement that started on one side had to come all the way back around to the left and then you're resorting to a header from 15 yards out not the best look Russo back to Rue Gennenbacher Jimmy Jacobello Russo over the top looking for Burns and Reed will play it out for a corner Notre Dame's had some decent runs on corners and set pieces. Wyatt Borso exiting the match. Nicholas Lejean in the mix. Legendary, excuse me. And Reed picks it up, and there could be an odd man break. Silla. He's got orange jerseys joining him. He wants to get back to that right foot. That's his preferred peg, and well defended by Ramsey. Knew it the whole way. He did not want to go to his left. Baffle in transition the other way. Bello takes the space, dinks it out to Russo. Diop defending him. Russo goes for goal right to the arms of Andema. Fumbles, pass wayward, headed down, and Gannonbacher on it, Jacobella. Well done by Parrish. the Fudicello, but he couldn't control that line drive. Headed down, 
Mohamed Say making it look easy. Beautiful service from Enrique Montana. And this thing is a wrap. Took the better portion of 60 minutes, but Mike Noonan's boys finally get it right. This is the greatness of rotation that can be the Clemson Tigers. At their best, when healthy, they can be one of the most lethal teams in the nation. Check out Say, into the pocket, just holds up play down into Silla, and then watch the reinforcements come through. Watch him check off onto the back post run. Great job. Great run by the senior, just over six foot three. The vision, Montana head up the entire time. Not enough pressure. You don't get rotation by before. Patty Burns doesn't come up high. You give anybody enough time to serve this ball and they're gonna put it exactly where they want to. And it certainly doesn't hurt that Mohamed Say sitting there laying and waiting. Fourth goal, first time we've seen it since the UVA game. This is what you want if you're Noonan. It's Silla, it's Say, it's three, and most certainly an opportunity to move on to the quarterfinals. The senior from Valencia, Spain, gets his 18th career goal in a Clemson jer jersey, and a big time to put this thing up, essentially away, up 3-0, and Notre Dame's down a man, if you're just joining us, folks. Bryce Bonneau got his second yellow card at the 54th minute mark, so it was a long road to hoe for Notre Dame, and now it's become all but all but insurmountable. That said, Dev, if you're if you're both teams, if you're if you're Mike Newton and Clemson, how do you manage these next 30 minutes, knowing you play the number one team in the nation or number one team in the ACC, the top seed, Duke, Sunday 8 o'clock Eastern here on ACC Network, and you have not faced them all year. You got to be very careful. Not only do you have that, you also got to manage your minutes, which is what I'm looking at here because. In case you're just joining us, Mike Noonan and the Clemson Tigers have stepped onto the pitch 17 times this season, 17 different times we've seen a different lineup. So think about that. Now you have an opportunity down the stretch sitting on a lead. You have to make sure that you're getting guys enough minutes. But coming in, the conversations behind the scenes that we had with, they're not overly healthy still. They're trying to get back into it. Still some sicknesses floating around campus. You want to protect your guys. So I'm looking right now for a little bit more rotation down the stretch with about 15 minutes to go. Keep them fresh, keep them confident, but you also got to play it safe. Hard to imagine that even in rotation because of the depth of this squad, that they could concede three to a 10-man Notre Dame team, which is moments to go. And Montana, you see they're cleared out by Baffour. Baffour, the freshman, does get his licks in. He's got six yellow cards on the campaign, but Jonathan Blinsky just talked to him there. No yellow issued. On that note about managing minutes, Devin, there are four Clemson players carrying a yellow right now. How many D up a center back? Isaiah Reed, one of your forwards. Enrique Montana on the ball, your right back. Not on the ball, it's Lundergaard, excuse me, just throwing it in as Montana. And Silla, one of your attacking players. So does that factor in? Would you get those guys off sooner rather than later? You would hope that they could be able to manage their, the game themselves, but I'm letting the game go for another 10 or 15 minutes. I don't see Mike Noonan taking everybody off. The only reason I say that is because he usually carries a tremendous amount of confidence for them to make good decisions. But why put yourself in that situation as well? Now, we're probably going to sit here and he's not going to take anybody off and they're going to be great and everything will be just fine, right? But you got to be careful too because you have a real opportunity on the weekend. Why diminish that by letting your most valuable pieces get themselves in a spot that you're going to regret? All right, now let's take you around the rest of the tournament here. Pitt and NC State in the second overtime. They're already up 2-1 through a Michael Sullivan goal. And George Keeper's not going to love this one. Turnover, Valentin Noel, one of the most effective scorers in the country. You give him that. That effectively ends the Wolfpack season. As Noel touches around the keeper, he slots at home. They added a fourth one, three goals in OT. They move forward now as the number six seed in this tournament. And they will play UVA on ACC Network, 4 o'clock Eastern on Sunday. Big time matchup again between two teams that are going to be in the tournament. But Pitt is a team we all thought would be contending for this ACC championship. Coming into the year, Devin, UVA was picked last in the Coastal. Nobody thought they would be here. They're a top four seed. They're top ten in RPI. This is a team that could make some noise, the Cavs and George Galnovich. I like the Cavaliers. I like Ian McIntyre and Syracuse, what they've been able to do. But that last time that Virginia and Pitt played, that was a fun one. It was really the coming out party for Philip Horton. 
the striker who probably doesn't get enough recognition because he's the running mate to Leo Afonso. Leo Afonso was the number two, three returning scorer in the ACC, who's having himself another great year. Couple of goals to his name. He's got four game-winning goals out of his five, and yet everybody forgets about Horton. Don't. The guy's awesome. He's got a ton of goals on the season, and the way that he operates is off of that left shoulder. And so Pitt will remember that. They'll remember that they saw a different look. They had to play a lot more direct in that game. But Jay Vidovich and his crew, they're going to be ready to go. There's some vengeance that's been sitting within that squad ever since they bowed out of the 2020 College Cup. They really haven't seen the height of their form, and that is a team, much like the Clemson Tigers, that at their best could take down the national title. Yeah, the Pitt team, we thought. I mean, Pitt, Clemson, really, at the end of the year, the two teams coming into the season. Here at the ACC Tournament first round, alongside Devin Kerr, I'm Dallin Cuff from Historic Riggs Field. The Clemson Tigers up 3-0 over Notre Dame, and that score doesn't exactly reflect how this game went. Early on, Notre Dame had a number of opportunities in the first 15 minutes. They were the better team, but then suffered two own goals, self-inflicted wounds as they play the ball in here, flicked on, and falls to the feet of Isaiah Reed. And then a Mohamed Say goal, just about 10 minutes ago is what made the difference here. And that's where we're at right now, 3-0. And the winner gets Duke on Sunday, 8 o'clock Eastern on ACC Network. Oh. Ahmed Say, after mentioned goal scorer on the ball. And hold it up. We got the world's football coming for you right now, but American football comes your way on Saturday. Week 10 college football lineup on ACC Network begins. Drake May, number 17, North Carolina, take on Virginia, Noon Eastern. Then it's the 20th ranked Syracuse Orange on the road in Pittsburgh to take on the Panthers. The day is capped off by the big one, one of the only uh, four ranked match, ranked to be ranked matchups in college football this weekend. Wake on the road at NC State for the primetime matchup. Great set of games and a big one there in Raleigh. See if Wake can bounce back off that shocking loss to Louisville and NC State. Now with a new quarterback, MJ Morris, the young man, step it in there for Jack Chambers before the injured Devin Leary before that. See if he can get Dave Dorn's crew to get a big win. Turnover opportunity here. Marco Garcia running into some space. Pings it out to Reed. Reed's got Garcia right there. Doesn't play him. Shoots it. And just wide. He's having fun, Isaiah Reed. And it gives you a glimpse of what was the greatness in the College Cup last season. Just watch. I love the decision making here. He gets a little peek up, looks over the shoulder, recognizes that he's one on one. And Ramsey's out of position a little bit as the center back slides over. You catch him on a quick little last step and then quick decision. Cut back to the inside and let it go. Little shimmies. This is the stuff that Isaiah Reed, as he continues, can be great. He, he truly can, but he's another one. Unfortunately, we sound like broken record, folks, but that's because that Mike Noonan has dealt with all of this for his players all season long. It's been Mohamed Say, Usman Silla, Isaiah Reed. Let's keep going. Brandon Parrish. And pretty much every player that has Amity worn yeah. the orange for Amadou Dia, right? Like, or Amadou Dia, excuse me. Every player that's worn the orange for the Clemson Tigers this season has had some sort of issue. That's not their fault. It's just the way of the world and the, the way that the season has gone for them. Yeah, 17 different games, 17 games, 17 different starting lineups have not had consecutive starting 11s. And that man, Mohamed Say, is the only guy to start all 16 games. Now 17, number nine in orange. But they're, they're, they are about as healthy as they've been all year. We know how talented they are. We've seen teams grow through tournaments and make runs. They are, they are more than capable of winning this championship which a lot of coaches would say it's harder than the NCAA. Do you agree with that? Is it harder to win the ACC tournament than it is to win the NCAA tournament? No, I disagree with that. And, why? and here's why. Number one, just because of the sheer amount of games. You're adding more games into the NCAA tournament. Also, the travel. To me, it's, it's more difficult in that sense. You have to go farther. You have to go longer. You know, it's the unfamiliarity as well. Now, I'm not saying these games against ACC opponents are easy. That's definitely not the case. We all know that the quality of talent is the highest around the nation. The problem that you run into within the argument between the, the, the two options are you don't see 
your Washingtons. You don't see Stanford all season long. You have an idea around the ACC what other teams are, what their tendencies are from year in and year out, and all of a sudden, you got to flick a switch come tournament time and go, we're playing a Lipscomb team or a Tulsa team. We didn't even know they were in the top 25. And yet now all of a sudden we got to we got to go on the road or, you know, we have to welcome them to our venue. You know, the level itself within the ACC is probably still the highest in the country. You could make an argument for the Pac-12 this season as well. But the sheer number of games that travel, when you encompass all of that together, it's the NCAA, NCAA championship for sure. And Clemson knows that all too well. I mean, last year in the Elite Eight, they had to go to Oregon State on the road to Oregon State and Corvallis, come from behind and win that game in penalties, advancing penalties, I should say. Opportunity maybe here. Shot off the pipe from Garcia. The freshman from Italy. I like this kid, though. This is the talent that keep an eye on him because Marco Garcia primarily operates on the right-hand flank, but as the season has gone on, Mike Noonan, he gets him to expose his game in a good way in different areas on the field. That's a great diagonal coming all the way back over. He started on the right, you start him in the middle. All of a sudden operating out of the nine spot, he's so much more comfortable within this attacking offense down. That's a guy for years to come that Mike Noonan should be able to call on. Interesting pedigree he has growing up in a club out there in Luguria, Italy, but had played against big time competition. The old lady, Juventus, Inter Milan, AC Milan. Played against a lot of their youth academies and U19 teams growing up and now finds himself in Alabama and then on the way here to Clemson. We are in the ACC Men's Soccer Championship. Well, it's fall season championships right now. Tomorrow, we got the women's semis. I hear on ACC Network, 5.30 p.m. Eastern, number one UNC. And Anson Doran's crew taking on Duke, number five. And then at 8 Eastern, it's the defending national champs, number two FSU seed, taking on number three seed Notre Dame as Marco Garcia is brought down. Field hockey championship game is Friday, two Eastern. And then Sunday, the men's soccer quarterfinals start at two Eastern as well. That's four games all day, everything right here on ACC Network and the ESPN app in the home of the ACC Championships. At 2 o'clock start time, Devin, you and I will be on the call as Virginia Tech tries to upset Wake Forest and keep their miracle run going as we take a look at the file here. There's that young man again, that bad, bad man. Marco Garcia. Marco. Pretty busy boy. Mm. You got to stay clean here, though, if you're the Clemson Tigers. That's what Noonan's preaching on the sideline. You've got your goals, you've got your zero. You want to go hunt for sure and see if you can pad this, continue with the journey towards confidence and greatness that will be the next round. But you also want to make sure that you're not giving up any goals, making positive decisions. This is where the thought processes that you institute now can follow you the rest of the tournament. And, of course, you mentioned it's get more games the NCAA tournament. If you're not a seeded team, you play five games. If you are seeded, you play four. As we watch the replay here with Garcia punching forward to Parrish. But, Devin, last year you saw this Notre Dame team start in this first round and win four games in four and get themselves to a championship, their first ever ACC title. Clemson will try to do the same thing. How hard is it to win from that spot, especially in that, that, that quarterfinal game? You know you're going on the road to one of the top four seeds. It's very difficult. People don't understand, you know, we talked about it a second ago in the NCAA tournament compared to the ACC tournament, what it's like. And I kind of lobbied for the NCAA tournament because you're on the road and it's difficult. The travel itself is one of the more difficult things to do because people around the country forget these are still students and these are young men. It's not like they, they can just drop everything and go play. Now, some of the liberties, depending on the school, help help aid you in that argument for sure. But a lot of these guys are still on a bus. You're still taking classes. I can remember last season, you and I sitting with the guys from Notre Dame at the College Cup. Five of those guys had finals the day before Rock their national yeah. semifinal, you know? And so they're traveling across the country. They're still students. So you have to focus on the game. You got to focus on your studies. And now you got to go on the road to do it. I don't envy any single one of them. But I trade places with them in a heartbeat to be back there with those guys. <laughs> I'd give anything to run that back again, man. 
You put me put me on the bus with some sort of, I don't know, Iliad or Odyssey or City of God, something to read where I was going to make up some sort of paper. But I would oh, love boy. to do it. I would love to do it. I mean, Notre Dame coach Chad Riley did tell us when they played at Pitt last Friday, it's a six-hour drive for them. They didn't just drive back. They, they waited, stayed there, tried to recover, had the six-hour drive back on Saturday, and have to be on the road again here to Clemson yesterday to play a game for their season, essentially, and a day that they're going to remember. They'll remember the final score line, but it's also, as we've talked about before, Devin, in different capacities, those opportunities lost. Good quick feet by Parrish. The opportunities missed because when they look back at this first 15 minutes, they would they are going to think we should have been up 1-0, maybe yep. even 2-0 to start the game. Yeah, that's not a far-fetched idea either. You know, you wonder, this is one of those ones when you get done with the game, you walk down to the sideline, and maybe Mike Newton wasn't willing to fully converse into what the decision-making process was, but you pick his brain on what the opening 20 minutes were like on the sideline because they were scrambling. Reminder, 17 different lineups for 17 games for the Clemson Tigers and yet they step in they absorb the wave two own goals at halftime grab another goal three to nothing and that gives you an idea of what this is going to look like a date with Duke on Sunday eight o'clock Eastern time Virginia Tech with the massive upset of the year not the tournament folks Mike Brizendine and co third win on the season first against ACC they'll get Wake Forest Pitt cruising of course that had to wait till overtime and then North Carolina finding a little bit of offense down the stretch here. I like their draws, but it's nice to see them get a dub and move on. Big opportunities for North Carolina. As you mentioned, they're on the bubble right now, 34 RPI. Anytime you're in the mid-30s, you're really skirting there. There's usually the lowest teams that get at larges are in that 32, 35, 36 range. So if they could get a win against Syracuse up in central New York, that would go a long way. As Syracuse is number three in the RPI rankings right now. I would pretty much put them in, so Carolina needs to deliver there. And talk about this Duke-Clemson game. They have not played this year, and these are two of the most talented teams in the league. Duke, best in terms of goals against average. They're unbeaten on the season. Who do you fancy in that Duke-Clemson game? It's really difficult to bet against that Duke team, isn't it? Because you see, you keep looking around going, all right, well, you know, that injury, they're going to have a problem. That guy's got COVID. Well, you know, all of a sudden, Sha Shaq Mohammed hasn't scored for a couple of games. Well, he puts the naysayers aside, and he bags a couple in a row. You know, you have to lean towards the Duke Blue Devils just to give them their respect, right? Unbeaten in conference play, unbeaten in regular season play. How to bet they're against them. They're at home, them. too. At home. And they're at home, too, right? Like, we haven't seen a team do that in, in God knows how long. Only five teams in, in the last 21 years, by the way, in ACC conference play have gone unbeaten. No one has done that in terms of keeping their regular season schedule intact as well. And so you have to lean with that Duke squad, squad but still, it's Clemson team. You want momentum. You want confidence. You're getting a lot of that right now. You clean a couple of things up. Mike Noonan talked about it going into halftime that he likes some of the movements going forward, but they got to clean some things up. It's just about decision making. There is no massive change that you're going to see right now between those two teams. It is a midfield battle that I'm really intrigued in, though, because of the way that Clemson plays. She found underneath Alvaro Gomez, and then usually Derek Wall. If you start bringing Peter Stroud and Kenan Hodden into the mix, those two guys, mm -hmm. you know, attacking off the back line, they can flatten out the middle. Shaq Mohammed up top, Jai Bean, those guys, they work. And the engine just goes and goes. It will certainly challenge the overall disposition of this Tigers team who loves to be on the ball. Because Duke can do it both ways, and they can do it either slowing the game down or transitionally. Sean Smart called for the foul. The freshman checks in, battling his way back from an injury earlier in the season, getting back to full health. And that Duke team has been outstanding. Last time a team went unbeaten in league play and then won the ACC tournament was Bobby Muse and that Wake Forest team back in 17. Duke and John Kerr will be trying to replicate that. John Kerr has never won as a coach the ACC tournament. Of course, Kerr won the 86 National Championship with Duke. He was the National Player of the Year as well. Never hurts. Pretty good. Helps. <laughs> Notre Dame looking for a lifeline. Round 
Voice on it. Ball taken away by Wallaf. Garcia, heavy touch, but finds its way to Parrish. Flag stays down. Excuse me, Trimnell. Tyler Trimnell, the freshman, can't handle it and turns it over and fouls. And some activity away from the ball, and Patty Burns is going to get a yellow now. Frustration boiling over for the Fighting Irish. Chad Riley doesn't agree with it, and you know, Patty Burns is having a little conversation with the referee. Just doesn't like the extended elbow that came back across, let him know it, and talked his way into it. been there man I, I, I experienced this point. firsthand and it is mentally debilitating to go through games like this where you don't play poorly you give up a goal you continue to play you give up another goal you come out of halftime you, you fight a little bit the red card happens you're just kind of looking around going well, what is going on here like what do we have to do you said frustration boiling over it gets it gets much more difficult as the seconds tick by it seems like the whistle that you heard way back when was an eternity ago and all you want to do is get off the field and that's a hard way to feel for a frustrating season that Notre Dame players have had Ooh. well Daniel LaRusso still fighting the karate kid from distance doesn't go in uh, here's your game recap and as you mentioned why it's frustrating Wyatt Borso first minute had a chance Joseph and Dame a huge save it was Notre Dame on the front foot early Dev and Dame made four saves inside 20 minutes and you see the one on goal, then the second one lets out a third goal from regulation play, and unfortunately, the second yellow. Bono ticks up a second yellow card in the 55th minute. His first was in the 32nd. That brought them down to 10 men. A terrible mistake by the young sophomore, and he'll learn, as will all of these young men for the Fighting Irish. Remember, number three freshman class coming into this season. Chad Riley, since he's come in his fifth year, he knows exactly how to get results at his alma mater. He brought all the success over from Dartmouth, that coaching tree, and Bobby Clark has served him well. They will be just fine. It's just a year where in a lot of situations it didn't go their way, much like the game tonight. But I'm sure that there is a bright future, not just for this program, but the young men that are on the field right now, certainly next season. Yeah, back-to-back -back years of top 10 recruiting classes that's yielded some fruit. Some of those freshmen last year, we talked about Rue, we talked about uh, Ramsey. Guys that really contributed as freshmen to that team that went to the College Cup semifinals, also won the ACC tournament. This freshman group here has gone through much more adversity. But a lot of these guys, vast majority will be back next year. A chance to get the Fighting Irish back to where they think they belong. Sean Smart on the ball. Strobeck tries to flick it on. Doesn't come together. Down by Lundergaard. Still loose. False around a voice. Oh, oh, and through the arms of Andema. Maybe a lifeline for the Fighting Irish. Down 3 1. Got to hustle back to the spot. Rada Voice's first goal of the campaign, second of his career for the junior. Injured all last year. And Andema sees his seventh shutout 
go by the wayside. Down, watch where it starts though. Mitch Ferguson, the freshman coming off the back line. I wanted you to keep an eye on this young man for a reason. As the ball came through, he steps right up into it, steps through the player, plays a great distributing ball coming off the back line, and that's what starts the attack going forward. Momentum one way for Clemson. If you step through the ranks and eclipse that first level, that starts to open up a ton of space. That's everything behind. So it's just a continuation for Notre Dame moving forward. Yes, on the back side of this, and Damas should have done better. You probably should have slid over faster. But that's the stuff that I talk about from some of these young players. A guy like Mitch Ferguson coming off the back line, finding out a voice up. They're able to grab one back. It may be a little bit too little, too late, but still a good sequence from Notre Dame. We'll see if that gives the Irish life. Ben Erkins just check in the match. Number two, junior defender from uh, South Carolina here. Check that. Not two, but 20 came in the match. Sean Smart out for how many D off? Should say exited the match. Cut back. Strobeck trying to make something out of nothing. Can't get there. Guard on the ball. Chifamba. Opportunity three on one here. Garcia lays it off for say. Can he make it a brace? Dowd got big, and no, he does not. Put it on your right foot here. You got a real good opportunity if you're Mohammed Say to shift the goalkeeper a little bit further. Watch the left. You touch it on your left and bring this over. You allow him just to pinch a little bit further. It cuts down the angle as a striker. You bring it back across to your right foot. Now, all of a sudden, You've got an opportunity on your strong foot. Go either direction. Bring it to your right. Pick out the bottom corner. Bring it back to your left. You've also got, there you go, right? Look right in the middle. Play the ball square back across from where it came from. Those are the little moments at the tail end of a game when you've been cruising for so long against a 10-man team that usually aren't very clean. Foul on the back post as Say tried to raise up. Over seven to go here. Clemson, South Carolina. Tigers leading 3-1 now. They were 3-0 until a Matthew Radavoisa goal changed things up. Alongside Devin Kerr, I'm Dallin Cuff. Tigers looking to close this thing out, move on to play Duke on Sunday. Trying to get in line. Garcia working. We heard some oohs and ahs out there from the crowd. We primarily talked about what he's capable of doing in an open run of play. He's got some quick feet, too. Low center of gravity, but you're matched up against a really impressive defender in Patty Burns, who unfortunately. The night didn't necessarily go his way. The own goal, 11 minutes in, got everything started. Attack-minded a little bit more this season. Five goals to his name, pretty impressive. 
Out swinging ball, say couldn't control. Parrish back to Wallace. Just over five to go. Two between Ento and Radovoisa. Russo. Russo lays it off. First time strike and Tama save. Notre Dame still asking questions. And Dama grabbing his leg afterwards. Oh, is that the way that he came down or he just spring a little cramp at the back end of this game? Good positioning though from the goalkeeper. Stalking from a distance. As the ball comes back to the inside, he comes all the way over to the left. It just over jumps in a little bit, but he's able to regain his composure, push it up over the top with his right hand. But as he comes down, watch him reach back. Still a bit lame, up and moving now, though. Good to see from Mike Noonan. Under four minutes to play, Notre Dame looking to make this interesting. No ball driven in. Cleared out, Garcia trying to win the foot race, and he does. Cut back, Giacobello gets a piece of it, but they'll maintain possession. Gomez on it. Burns dispossesses Sandy. He'll look long. Russo can't bring it down. Diop back to Andema. Just over three, Garcia, nice touch into space and then rolls it to Gomez. He's rolling on a 3v3, Burn steps. Parrish making the run bottom of the screen. Floated over the top, all by his lonesome. Oh, oh. Dr. Gomez gonna want that one back. Oh boy. Ooh. Why do I hear the Price is Right song in my head? Oh, that is. That's coming up in video review at some point in time in the next couple of days. <laughs> See this, guys? This is what you don't do. Do you feel like they've just kind of switched off here? What are you saying? Yeah, it's, it's quiet now for the Clemson Tigers, and that's, you know, Mike Noonan's going to talk to his guys. You got to finish the game. Mm -hmm. Have fun. Go attack. Got to defend, but we got to finish the game. And, Look, against a team that's feeling more confident about themselves, against a team that's better, they're going to make you pay. KK Baffour trying to make them pay. Baffour steps through, clearance off his chest. And now Garcia's going to try to run this thing down. He's got Ramsey on a full sprint with him. All ACC freshman team defender last year, Ramsey shows him why. Just beasting Garcia. Quick switch out to Ento. And he wandered offside. We talked about the freshmen and how they've had a chance this year. That was the silver lining of all these injuries, all this COVID. These freshmen that usually wouldn't get as much time on this talented Clemson team, look at the minutes. And Sean Smart should have more minutes. He was dealing with injuries himself, as was Nathan Richmond at times. And these guys have really contributed different ways and no more maybe than Andema in the goal now as he's locked down that spot, Devin. There's a massive talking point for Mike Noonan coming in about the opportunity with all the injuries and the COVID concerns and just sicknesses that have run rampant through this team for these guys to get a shot and step into the lineup. It's really simple for people to think it's a high level school. They train and, you know, they'll get some minutes. There's a big difference, though, get minutes with all due respect against teams like UMass or UNC Greensboro, even though they lost that game, compared to a North Carolina, a Wake Forest, a Pitt. 
This is the elitist crowd within college soccer. And so these young men, 17, 18, 19 years of age, getting an opportunity to compete at the highest level in college soccer, you can't put a price tag on that. Well, I'm going to say on one goal, will he try to make it two? Will he try to hook up a teammate? Lays it off. Garcia's there. Takes two touches. Third. Shot deflected. Wallace and Baffour battling. 20 seconds left. And Skinner is down. As the clock winds, you do not want to see that. Jonathan Belinsky is going to let it run out, let the game end with Skinner down on the deck. And in the end, that's how it finishes. The Tigers three, the Fighting Irish one. Notre Dame cannot avenge the College Cup loss.